Right. Hi, guys. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> not necessary. I'm trying to figure out where to stand, so so I'm not in your way, but I'm not always looking at the screen with my back to you. Oh, perfect. Okay. Is it better over there? Okay. I'll try. I'll 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 move around. <laughs> All right. Let me give. Uh, yikes. Let me get a sense of who you guys are first, so I can kind of tweak it as I go. Um, you know, community health nursing, uh, ed, teachers, school count, school-based counselors. Oh, good. Okay. WIC. And WIC program. Okay, awesome. And WIC program. Um, you know, frontline mental health counselors, uh, program directors, mostly community-based folks. Who, who did I miss? Who else is? Health educators. Okay. Any teachers? Some teachers. Okay, great. And program administrators or program directors and stuff. Okay, I'll try to tweak it to make this relevant. And um, basically, I'm just going to talk about the the current research, the state of the science, what we know about sort of the um, uh, mental health and and just general health effects brain, body, and behavior across the developmental spectrum uh, of cannabis. And so I want to focus, I'll drill down on prenatal marijuana exposure, what we've learned about that, and what we need to be alert to. A little bit about inadvertent marijuana exposure, all the way infants, toddlers, to preteens. Uh, we're seeing a lot more of that in the emergency room presentations and, and hospitalizations of really sick kids. Um, at, at Children's Hospital, and then I, you know, I, I'm a child adolescent addiction psychiatrist. We we'll drill down on the neurotoxicity of, of cannabis on adolescent brain development uh, specifically, and what some of the mechanisms are. Why is it uh, toxic? And then some of the just neuro, it's not benign uh, in adults either who could illegally go in and purchase it in Colorado. What are the health effects? What are we seeing in terms of uh, uh, public health impact, in terms of uh, medical costs and, and uh, illnesses related to um, cannabis, as well as injuries? So let's start with prenatal exposure. Again, I can't really, I'll, I'll stand over here so I'm not always back to you on prenatal exposure. I'm gonna be drawing most of my comments. There are now three longitudinal studies. Uh, two, of, two are completed, the first two, the Ottawa, and then the maternal health practices um, from uh, Pittsburgh. But the Generation R study is ongoing, but these are longitudinal studies that, that really have a, uh, the data will uh, inform causality, really. And they, and they, you know, they're done by some of the finest uh, longitudinal uh, research groups in the world. And then also we have a kind of a burgeoning literature coming out about the sort of neurobiological uh, implications. Where does it bind in the, in the fetal brain? How does this impact the fetal brain development? And Yasmin Hurd, who uh, I believe is still at uh, uh, Mount Sinai, she's one of the leading experts in uh, neuroimaging, neuroimaging and an expert on this field. Most of the research I'll present uh, comes from her or derivative. So one of the stunning articles that came out uh, in 2013, to, to my mind, was really a mechanism of showing how the endocannabinoid system starts to develop uh, in, you know, during fetal development. Most of it gets going uh, second, third trimester, but a little bit in the first trimester. First trimester exposure to marijuana is dangerous. Even so women don't know they're pregnant, oftentimes. And, uh, you know, OB-GYN practices nurses, we really need to not turn a blind eye. We're all over tobacco and alcohol, but we really need to be on cannabis. And I'll show you why. Yes, this is a quote from Yasmin Hurd, I mean, an, the expert. It, uh, I, I wouldn't have gone so far, but she says it causes cannab cannabis, fetal exposure to cannabis causes permanent neurobehavioral and cognitive impairments in children. It limits the computational power of neuronal circuits. That's a big hit. That is a big hit. I'll show you why, because THC binds to the cannabis. They have, you know, fetal brains have more nicotine receptors, more cannabis receptors than the adult brain. And so it's quite vulnerable to that. And the THC that's in Colorado is pretty, is high potency. It binds to the cannabinoid receptors in that developing fetal brain. And uh, essentially, 
Well, I'll, I'll, I'll give you a tidbit of the details if you're interested. Basically, there's a, there is a protein or a gene that's turned on during fetal development that uh, kind of loosens the microtubules around axons so axons can grow to where they're supposed to grow and hook up with all kinds of different circuits in your brain. Cannabis specifically, THC specifically, uh, reduces or disrupts that protein so the microtubules won't let go and the axon cannot grow the, the appropriate length. That's stunning. I mean, that is from the animal research and they found it in fetal human brains. So that's, it's not just animal research, you know, rats that have a rat brain. This is both. That's really stunning and, uh, and scary. So uh, prenatal exposure, what's the big deal? So why are we worried about that? You know, if the axons can't go to where they're supposed to go and they can't link up, that's why it interrupts the neuronal circuitry and computa ultimate computational power of the brain. And so what we've seen from the longitudinal studies, and they're largely descriptive, is that, you know, in infancy, right after birth, um, they thought at first it was associated with low birth weight, hard to know. Um, that finding is there in some studies, not there in some. But poor sleep continuity and poor organization, uh, their infants are more dysregulated. And, and by the time they're three years old, you can get a sense of, you know, can do little baby IQ tests, um, you can see that they have deficits in short-term memory and verbal reasoning as early as three years of age. This continues on. Deficits by six, deficits in impulse control, reading and visual analysis, abstract reasoning and hypothesis testing, just when they're first starting school, something that looks a lot like ADHD, co poor concentration and attention, some hyperactivity, and some studies have shown reduced IQ that has not held up over time. Uh, the, the IQ hit, but, but certainly learning, the, uh, learning disabilities, inattention, hyperactivity, something that held up in these studies, if I can figure out the, uh, yeah, is this business of, there was a robust finding of onset, of early onset of depression, especially in boys by age 10. That is a big hit. Um, so, and then by the time age 14, deficits in attention, verbal, abstract reasoning, they just continue on more conduct problems, delinquent behavior, increased risk of early onset cannabis use. Human studies are messy because you couldn't control for, okay, the women didn't just use cannabis, did they use nicotine too, a little bit of alcohol. You can't control for everything in human studies. So that's why they can't say, this is exactly and specifically what cannabis causes. However, if you take all the animal research where you can control it, animal research shows the same findings. So, um, if you put that together, this is probably pretty robust. It translates into overall the kids who have fetal exposure and pretty significant. The, 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 the Pittsburgh study, women who smoked less than one joint a day or more than one joint a day, that w these were the findings. The average number of joints per day that the women who, in the more than one joint per day category uh, was about two and a half joints per day. I can tell you in Pittsburgh, 20 years ago when this study started, it was not the potency of the marijuana that we're smoking in Colorado. So you, I don't even know how you translate that dose into something. So, you know, one joint of what we got here every day uh, would probably cross the threshold of more than one joint per day. So the bottom line is it translates into robust findings of poor academic achievement um, from prenatal exposure. So, and, and just mark my words, one of the things I'm most concerned about, because we've later found out that, that cannabis exposure, regular use in, in adolescence, looks like it also increases their risk of becoming addicted to other substances tried later. Uh, it's sort of like a kindling effect. I, the question that in my mind is, are, are the brains kindled in, with prenatal exposure? Because it kind of looks a little bit like that. And no one's looking at that, uh, or I haven't seen any literature on that, but that's kind of scary. Uh, this then has a snowball effect over time because, all right, if you're depressed, you know, depression itself hasn't bumps your risk of um, developing a substance disorder, conduct problems, and hanging out with a deviant peer group. Um, if you've got this going into teen, you know, early teenage into your teenage years, and so. 
uh, let me see if I can figure this out, then the con if you have conduct disorder academic problems and you're hanging out with a deviant peer group, you're going to start smoking marijuana. And, and you, you have double the risk for uh, depression. If you, have the ad if you just have conduct problems and academic problems, that also increases your risk of de depression. And then um, uh, we know that adolescent onset marijuana use in terms of just the, what's the relationship to mental health problems, adolescent onset marijuana use doubles your risk for depression anxiety disorders, not right away, but into your early to mid-20s. And that's a pretty robust finding. We also know adolescent onset marijuana use, I'll say more about that when we get to the adolescent part, that is, it, it quadruples the risk of psychosis, that's a bad hit, and conduct disorder and it's been associated with reductions in adult IQ, permanent, it looks like permanent reductions. So uh, and poor academic performance, all of these things adding up, basically predicts fail, you know, failure, high school dropout, uh, certainly uh, interferes with college entry and completion, as well as it translates into lower SES, underemployment, unemployment, and adulthood. Uh, so that's, you know, in other words, if you have this going in, it doubles the risk for all these things that then further snowball. So um, moving on to inadvertent marijuana exposure, kind of infants, toddlers to preteens, we know that th there was a, uh, a paper that came out uh, weighing at all the, in JAMA, uh, and it was really a chart review, about 500 charts from 2009 to 2011, and 500 charts, uh, an equivalent number of charts before we uh, relaxed our medical marijuana uh, laws and saw the explosion of dispensaries. And so that just went through 2009. They had never seen a case of unintentional pediatric exposure to marijuana prior to 2009, never. I mean, it just wasn't there. And then they had 17 cases in this two-year period. That doesn't seem like a lot. We've seen a lot more since then, but uh, it was mostly edibles, right? Uh, which, of course, begs the question of, I don't know, how long has it been since you saw candy cigarettes in a grocery store? <laughs> I remember about 35 years at least. I mean, I remember my uncle smoked, and I said, hey, would you buy me some candy cigarettes? And, you know, I wanted to smoke like him, right? And we haven't seen candy cigarettes, but marijuana with gummy bears and lollipops. And, I mean, we don't allow alcohol and tobacco to be packaged in ways that are extraordinarily appealing to young children, do we? I mean, what's up with, I mean, that's a duh, right? I mean, if we go ahead, if we continue to pa allow packaging like that, we, we're implicitly just saying we're okay with increased hospitalizations of kids because that's what's going to happen. I don't care how you carry it out of the store in a brown bag. If you open it up and you've got lollipops in the, or uh, gummies, um, it's going to happen. So... Uh, the other thing about inadvertent exposure, and this doesn't have to do with edibles, unless you translate that loosely, is breast milk. <laughs> that is THC, you know, breastfeeding mothers should not be smoking weed because it's fat soluble, it stores in the breast, it, disrupt, it, it crosses, uh, it gets to the baby, disrupts sleep cycle, it, and it can store in the fatty tissues for several weeks. Disrupted unsettled feeding cycles, and, and we don't know, it hasn't been investigated beyond that. So, uh, and we know that marijuana-related calls to, po the, to Rocky Mountain Poison Center have, have really shot up, both in Washington but in Colorado. The Rocky Mountain Poison Center has re received many, many calls of uh, uh, acute poisonings and intoxication with marijuana. Moving on to impact on the adolescent brain. So this is my kind of little pat area. Uh, you know, the big study that came out in 2012 Meyer et al. This is really the primo longitudinal research group in the world. They're very, very careful. Um, Terry Moffitt is, is one of the senior uh, researchers in this study, and they looked at this a, a lot, many ways. It's a longitudinal study that followed, you know, a birth cohort uh, into their late 30s, till 38. And, and so I'm going to draw a fair amount of what I say from that study, but it is not the only study that shows uh, persistent neurocognitive deficits and possibly permanent uh, deficits in neurocognition and, and IQ. But just to remind ourselves that mental illness and addiction are both largely pediatric onset disorders, right? That is, half of all psychiatric disorders in the DSM 
have an onset by the age of 14, about half, and uh, three quarters by the age of 24. So largely pediatric onset. And we know that almost uh, most adults who suffer from chronic addiction started using when they were adolescents. They're pediatric onset and um, and that's where we need to really focus our attention uh, if we're talking about prevention efforts. Uh, because the brain's, brain, when it's rapidly developing, is more vulnerable to a hit. It's just under construction, and it's more vulnerable to a hit. The issue is, of course, that over you know, uh, 111 million Americans have tried marijuana at least once. And this, these are 2012 data, so uh, it's, it's, these are probably underestimates at best. And, we, and it's not just like, well, the people who were already using marijuana just continue using marijuana. It's recruiting new users. In 2012, we knew that 2.4 million used for the first time. Okay, and so, um, and, and that makes some sense with the kind of the industry marketing. It's, oh, it's a benign recreational drug. What's the big deal? Um, low perception of risk. That's been going down for a number of years in our country and certainly in Colorado amongst youth and adults, yeah, benign, re some have even questioned, no serious scientist would ever question whether it's actually, marijuana is not addictive, but you hear that said a lot. It is addictive, and I'll show you the evidence for that. And it, it, the mechanisms are the same as most drugs of abuse. That is, it increases dopamine in the brain reward system. Uh, it continue, you know, it, it uh, kind of commandeers the executive, portion of your brain and you become addicted, repeated exposure. It, the addiction pathways are a neurobiology of the addiction of cannabis, very similar to the addiction pathways for whatever you got, tobacco, heroin, uh, cocaine, stimulants, and uh, caffeine, <laughs> whatever. But it's clearly addictive. Regular, the, the issue now is with the low perceived risk, the big, the burgeoning of acceptance in the uh, nationwide is that regular use and daily use amongst teenagers is at 30-year peak levels. And in Colorado, since 2009, we have been kind of nudging along. We're higher than the national. These are national figures. We're at levels higher than that. So it's concerning because a quarter of seniors uh, say, you know, I've used in the past month. That's how the Monitoring the Future study defines regular use the past month. But that doesn't mean once in the past month because 40% of those who say, I used in the past month, say, I've used at least 12 or more days. So let's say, so nudging up to half of the days. That's, you know, at least weekly use, and 6.5 percent, or so one in 15 say, I'm a daily, of high school seniors say, I'm a daily or near daily user. Um, what we know is, of those adolescents who experiment with marijuana, one out of six will progress to dependence, become addicted to it. That's a big number. I mean, so it's, you know, you try it, you might, I might not like it. I mean, I tried, I hated it. It's like, wow, a drug that makes me hungry, lazy, and not as smart. I mean, <laughs> was just not going to be my drug. <laughs> I mean, I'm going to eat a lot. That wasn't going to be my drug. I, the others I could be vulnerable to, but not that one. But I don't know why people like it, really. But uh, not for me. But anyway, <laughs> I, I wouldn't be standing here. <laughs> Uh, so, but anyway, the bottom line is, wow, that's a lot of kids using at levels that have been associated with a six to eight point reduction in their adult IQ that looks like you don't get it back. That's a big hit. We know that from the Monitoring the Future studies that marijuana use amongst teenagers has surpassed uh, cigarettes. They think cigarettes are nastier than marijuana by a long shot. And we ought to be treating, you know, in addiction treat. We ought to be treating the two together because, well, uh, this is my field, so I'll just put it on my shoulders. In addiction treatment programs, oftentimes nicotine dependence is ignored, right? Yeah. It's like, oh my God, don't make them stop smoking cigarettes. They'll be a serial killer. We're making them stop everything else, you know? It's like, it turns out that's, that's, a, that's actually a crazy notion. Well, it's a perfect opportunity. The same coping strategies, the same skills you're teaching them to stop and use coping with craving, whatever. Other substances are easily generalizable and applied to smoking. It's the perfect time to stop smoking. But the issue with marijuana is it's the same route of administration, right? So, so it begs the question, if we ignore, certainly for adolescents, this marijuana is still the number one reason that, for which they're referred to drug treatment. 
So if they're smoking weed, we go, okay, my PO officer says I have to stop or I'm going to jail. So we look at the urine for THC, and he says, okay, I can't. I don't want to go to jail. So we stop smoking marijuana. Do we inadvertently, if we ignore tobacco, inadvertently, iatrogenically, um, make their nicotine dependence worse? Do they start smoking more cigarettes because we made them stop smoke? We don't know the answer to that question, by the way, but it's a reasonable question. Or do we, if we ignore tobacco, inadvertently if interfere with their ability to get clean, stop marijuana, because they're constantly cueing themselves smoking cigarettes. Mm -hmm. And we don't know the answer to that either, but the bottom line is we ought to be treating together. After all, nicotine is, probably kills more people in the end, certainly does, and uh, it's the opportunity to treat. So I'll just get off that high horse right now. Uh, um, yes? I was just gonna ask, is there an equal, uh, since it is, something you smoke, is there an equal chance of lung cancer or any of those from what you get for It doesn't look like there's an equal chance of lung cancer from cannabis <laughs> smoking. Uh, although bronchitis, it irritates the airway, no question about that. Um, and we don't know why we haven't seen more cancer, but in part it might be because marijuana actually does have some anti-inflammatory properties. And um, so, and we know that there are in most marijuana you smoke, there are, are known carcinogens. You know, there's 200 other contaminants in it too. But uh, uh, so far, well, we haven't seen the same rates or similar rates of, of lung cancer from smoking um, marijuana. Um, so daily use has really uh, risen. This is the Monitoring the Future samples, a national sample of eighth graders, 10th graders, 12th graders, uh, red, yellow, green, respectively. What, uh, and we know that that's been increasing for several years. The issue is we know that, um, in, we know that in medical marijuana states and now recreational states that rates of use amongst um, teenagers is higher than the national averages and the potency of the marijuana is, is orders of magnitude higher. And so the problem is there have been two recent studies that I've seen just came out this year that shows that the higher potency THC uh, uh, you in further increases your risk of psychosis beyond what just regular cannabis we, we've already known for quite some time. So the higher the potency, the bigger the hit, and the greater the risk of psychosis, and it already quadruples the risk of psychosis. What we don't know in adolescence is, so you can have a psychotic episode. We do know that certain individuals have a genetic vulnerability in the uh, catecholamine O methyl O transferase gene, COMPT gene, that they're already predisposed to schizophrenia, so they have a risk factor for schizophrenia. It looks like those, if you have that, uh, either uh, heterozygous or homozygous, y you smoke weed in adolescence, it'll, it may precipitate an earlier onset of your schizophrenia that you may have developed later anyway, but still, an earlier onset of that illness versus later onset is a poor prognosis overall. So that's a bad hit. But clearly now we've seen it, cannabis can induce a psychotic episode and perhaps persistent psychosis even if you don't have the genetic vulnerability for schizophrenia. And I'll show you what the thinking is on that. One of the problems for every time you see increased use of a drug, you always see a, almost a concomitant uh, in relationship between perceived risk. When perceived risk goes down, use goes up, okay? And so that is what's been happening with marijuana across the country, and certainly Colorado, Washington, we're, we're all in the same boat. It, I don't understand it because, first of all, I, I think the press didn't do due diligence before we all went to the polls and voted on it. I mean, because, you know, nerdy scientists, we're sitting in front of our computers in our offices. They have to come to us, you know, if they want to hear the science. And they didn't show up back before we voted. I mean, they weren't in my office. Now they are, they're hounding, like, what is up with you people? <laughs> now they're interested in the science. Well, Pandora is out of the box. I don't think we're gonna get Pandora back in that box. But, but, um, but why are, if an industry advocate says, yeah, we don't think it hurts, we don't even think it's a, why would that be weighted the same as the data? It's, it's beyond my ability to comprehend, but it, it still is. Like, Wow, why would what you just said have any, th the data are all here. 
similarly, when I served on the governor's regulatory panel, before we legalized, they said, you know, well, Dr. Reeds, what should go on the warning label? Uh, well, based on those three longitudinal studies, I'd say at a minimum what should go on the warning label is um, uh, women who are or may be pregnant should not consume this product, right? I mean, there's no data opposing that, and there's a bunch of data, both animal and human studies, supporting that. That made it to the label in Washington. It did not make it to the label here. Now, I understand that there's legislation recently. Uh, maybe it's going to come, but what's up with that? Uh, uh, why didn't make it to the warning label? Clearly it should. Perceived riskiness has declined and that correlates with an increase or a rise in use. Here's the, here's the stuff about the addiction. We've known for a long time that cannabis is addictive. No, no serious scientist of any sort should ever, would ever question that. Is it as addictive as uh, tobacco? No, it's not. Or uh, cocaine or heroin? It is, no. It's about on par with, let's say, stimulants, analgesics, m more addictive than psychedelics, but it has the same mechanisms. We know that one, roughly 9% or 1 out of 11, in generally, 1 out of 11 who tries it or experiments with it will progress to dependence or addiction. And when you are dependent or addicted, it means you daily or n near daily use. And there is a clearly well-substantiated withdrawal syndrome. Not everyone has a, you know, people who smoke marijuana and stop, you know, cold turkey. Not everybody would have a, a significant withdrawal syndrome from cannabis. Pretty much everybody who is a pack a day smoker of cigarettes stops abruptly and then uh, they will become a serial killer, right? I mean, right? <laughs> withdrawal from tobacco, no question about it. Give, you know, gotta have NRT or, or you will be a serial killer. Now, about 30, per, 30 35% of folks who, um, in general, who are regular daily or who have cannabis dependence who stop will have a withdrawal syndrome. Now, we don't know. That might be higher for people who smoke high potency uh, uh, THC you know, products. But um, uh, that withdrawal syndrome, it doesn't look, you know, kind of a, a malaise, kind of achy muscles, GI upset, maybe diarrhea, sleep disruption. You want to sleep more. I mean, and. Um, uh, or sleep less, um, uh, sometimes anorexia, decreased appetite, those kinds of things. Cert but it's a, it's a significant withdrawal and it also sets up a craving cycle. In other words, an abstinence syndrome like, I'm really craving, I've got to have it. It generally peaks at a, mm, five, seven days and then attenuates to relatively benign after two weeks. But you see it. And um, so it's clearly addictive. One out of 11 in the general public become addicted if they experiment, but one out of six adolescents who experiment becomes addicted or cannabis dependent. And that's uh, because, you know, adolescents in general, they're more vulnerable to, the, to addiction. So when they try it, one out of six will progress, especially those who have a constellation of risk factors that we already know, environmental risk factors. Prenatal exposure may be one of them. People aren't looking at that, but you know, the usual abuse, neglect, um, uh, uh, emotional abuse, um, family history of a lot of substance use disorder, uh, not doing well academically in school, um, you know, poor performance, learning dis dis disabilities, ADHD, um, hanging out with a deviant peer group, those, all of those, then if you try it, you experiment, you're much more likely to become addicted if you have those environmental risk factors. So, because we know people who try in general, about 85% of kids before they graduate from high school are going to try something, right? 85% no, don't go on to be addicts, right? So, who, who is vulnerable? It's the kids who have those risk factors, who are, who are going to, when they try it, it solves a problem in their life. Like, wow, this helps me cope with all the adversities of my life. So, you all, I'm talking to the choir, you all see this all the time. You all know this. Uh, this business about IQ, so again, they followed more than a thousand individuals from birth to age 38 in the Meyer et al. study and, um, you know, started using and then con persistent or continued use um, was associated, they saw a persistent drop about on average if you were a multiple times weekly, and it's not real clear if it's four or five times a week to daily use, that level of use was what was associated with six to eight point reduction in IQ. Um, 
starting in adolescence. Why? What, what's the neurobiology of that? What's the, why would we even think that? Well, it turns out that the, the, we, you know, we have an endocannabinoid system. The cannabis 1, CB1, there's CB2 receptor, CB1 cannabis receptor in your brain uh, is critical. It's critically involved in regulating the business the development of the business end of your brain, the prefrontal cortex. So if you've got THC sitting on the CB1 receptor, that's going to disrupt the development of the prefrontal cortex, executive fun functioning, all the things in the prefrontal cortex, your executive functioning that can override those nasty little limbic drive, things from your limbic system like, let's go, I don't know, I'll try to outrun the train or, or whatever. You know, if you want to wrap your head around what's going on from about age 10 to well into your mid to late 20s, the brain's under construction. And there's more risk taking in normal teenagers. We're not talking about cannabis. Normal teenagers are riskier, um, m more impulsive, and take, you know, make poorer decisions. If you want to wrap your head around this, think of yourself at age 15. Think of yourself at age 25. Pretty much the difference is what myelination development of your prefrontal cortex and wiring it up to your limbic system did for you. Like at 25, like, you know, I don't think I'll do that. 15, yaha. So that's the normal brain of a teenager. But if you've got THC sitting on your cannabis one receptor that's regulating the development of that prefrontal cortex, uh, it disrupts Glutamate pathway, all kinds of pathway developments. You have to trust me, we won't handle the, the minutia there. But it's not the only study because we saw this trade coming uh, years ago. And Pope et al. in 2003 published a study that showed that compared to controls, those who started, who started smoking marijuana after the age of 17, those who started smoking regularly before the age of 17 had clear deficits in executive functioning, working memory, verbal fluency, and learning um, it, uh, well into their 20s, at tw age 25, 26. Uh, Judith Brooks, same thing, in 2008, she did a similar study. Adolescents who started smoking marijuana between the ages of 14 and 22, even those who stopped at age 22, still had cognitive deficits and problems with learning and memory by the age of 27 compared to non-users. That's we, that's pretty substantial, and all the animal literature shows the same thing. So um, that's believable. So just to reiterate, four it quadruples the risk of psychosis, and that's partly because that THC sitting on the CB1 receptor disrupts, we think, glutamate pathway development, which can, you know, trust me, it just can make you crazy. <laughs> you can make you psychotic. And uh, may risk, um, this is worrisome because there's not been a lot out, but there are some human studies now that corroborate the animal studies that exposing the adolescent, this is what rat studies, so exposing the adolescent rat brain as opposed to the adult rat brain to marijuana, they liked, then you expose them to cocaine uh, or methamphetamine, they liked those better and became addicted to those versus the ones not exposed to marijuana until they were in adulthood. All right, but there's some human studies coming out now that looks like, mm, that's looking the same. So it may, cannabis, when you're smoking weed as an adolescent, it may increase your liking and your uh, risk of it becoming addicted to other things tried later, like alcohol, like methamphetamine, like whatever you get into. It's clearly associated, not just the IQ deficits, a big hit socioeconomically, high school dropout, non-college completion, poor academic achievement, and unemployment, underemployment, lower SES as an, into adulthood. So, you know, what are we doing, people, here? I don't know. Um, but at least some studies have shown 10. SAMHSA estimates that 10 to 15 percent of, of high school students na nationwide would meet criteria for a cannabis use disorder, okay? Uh, uh, mild, moderate, or severe. But about 10, almost 10 percent are using at a level associated with the six to eight point reduction. That is a lot of our youth, that is a lot of our kids. And I would, I've been speaking in a lot of public health symposia and people, I'd say that and people would not, in the audience I'd go, I just said 10, six to eight points. I mean, and no one in the audience would go, oh my God. I mean, so I thought, well, why, this message is really not penetrating. Yeah. I mean, like, what can I do to make this message like 
relevant. And I went back to the old lead poisoning literature, <laughs> right? And I'll go, I'll go back and I go, I wonder what Canfield said about uh, environmental lead exposure, 10 micrograms per deciliter of environmental lead exposure on average causes an average 7.4 reduction in their, their IQ uh, and you don't get it back. A 30 year study showed and that's permanent, 7.4. That is what we are talking about, 6 to 8, 7.4. I mean, it is just like this. So, uh, and the, as the potency increases, we also know this first episode of psychosis. So if you just took that alone, the reduction in IQ, and 10% of our kids before they graduate high school will be smoking at that level, conservatively speaking, unless it continues to get worse. Uh, well, if there's a neurotoxin in the air or the water that at least 50% of our kids were gonna be exposed to, one out of six at, exposed at levels that are gonna cause this big hit, six to eight point reduction, uh, we'd be all over that, you know? Get it out of our gasoline, that lead. Get it out of our paints, our cribs, everything. But we, there's no outcry. I mean, if this is not a public health crisis, I, I just don't even know what one is. That's just the adolescent hit. Leave alone prenatal exposure, the edibles, the kids hospitalized. I, I put this slide in just to remind ourselves, marijuana is not the only concern here. <laughs> it's not, because prescription medication abuse in this in Colorado, nationwide, but in Colorado, we're one of the worst states. Uh, you, you know, deaths related to opioid overdose, there's more deaths related to that than vehicle accidents in this country. That's, that's huge. That's a huge public impact. And nationally, here's what we're worried about with teens. One in four teens, about 24%, reports that at some point in their lifetime they've misused a prescription medication. It might not be an opiate, but largely, it's opiates and stimulants, or, or largely. Most of them get them from a parent's medi medicine cabinet, right? Or they buy them from somebody at school who took it from their medicine, mom's medicine cabinet, right? They get it from a friend or a parent or a family member. Uh, now, one in seven Colorado high school students report that, so that's not as bad, actually, as the national norm, at least, I can't remember when this was, I think this was a um, 2013 report. So, but, um, but the highest age of misuse of prescription opiates, so Oxy, Vicodin, all of those, is in the 18 to 20, or the early college age years, or young adulthood. All right, so that is from national data from the National Survey on Drug Use Survey. So, but what we have is an epidemic amongst young people in transitioning from uh, uh, non-medical prescription opiate use transitioning to injection heroin use. We have an epidemic in this country about that. And, and, and the governor, we're all very concerned about, you know, I'm on the governor's consortium to reduce prescription drug abuse in Colorado, one of 14 states part of this consortium, because we were number two, Colorado. And so, but think about it, as prescription drugs um, get tight, more tightly controlled uh, and more expensive, frankly, we need to be alert to the um, potential consequences that that might push kids. Wow, I can't afford the oxy anymore. I think I'll just start inject. We, we may see an even a worsening. Everything has a consequence. And you gotta think about the down and the upside. We might even see more injection heroin or a faster um, um, path to uh, prescription opiate to injection heroin amongst youth. The criminal justice system is saying that injection her heroin use is the number one drug they're seeing, surpassing marijuana. We're going, no, that can't be true. Because marijuana is still the number one reason they're referred to drug treatment. Well, that, if that's true, and it looks like it is, because I asked for a report from the Office of Behavioral Health, it still is the number one reason adolescents are referred and young adults are referred to treatment, which suggests that the kids who are messing around with prescription opiates we are bypassing the treatment system altogether and they're going to IV heroin and we never see them in the treatment system. In my mind, what is the implication of that? We better get serious about screening in schools because where they're starting is at adolescence and that's where they start messing around with prescription drugs and if we are not catching it there and if we can identify it in the schools, for God's sakes, it's not gonna work to refer them out to some community-based treatment program, right? That does not work. We better get serious about on-site, bell-to-bell, 
school-based treatment, <laughs> drug in the schools. We got 10 to 15 percent of our kids in high schools right now meeting criteria for a, a substance use disorder. That means they could benefit from drug treatment. More on that later. <laughs> Stay tuned. But um, so I just want us to also be aware that this is a huge problem as well, the prescription drug abuse. So now let's get to drill down on this business. This is um, every year of my entire career, 20 years, I've seen the same number it has not budged an inch, not one percentage point. That is SAMHSA every single year publishes the same number that uh, 90%, only 10 or less than 10% of youth who could benefit from substance tr treatment receive it. 90% of kids who could benefit from drug treatment do not receive it. That is a treatment gap we would not tolerate in any other area of medicine. Right? If 10% of cancer patients could get treatment for cancer, would we stand for that? Or 10% of people who have diabetes could get treatment for diabetes? We would not stand for that. We've, we stood for this my entire, way before my career started, and it's not budged an inch. What the heck is going on? Well, well in, in large part, that's an artifact of the third party payer system, right? Mm -hmm. Who pays for drug treatment in this country for kids? It's largely the juvenile justice system, right? Or social services. So that means we require kids to fall in the hole, juvenile justice, before they could even get to treatment. They're at a more serious or severe state at that point and have a, boatload of psychiatric comorbidity, legal problems, family, social, I mean they got the whole catastrophe right then. Every advance in medicine, every one, every advance in medicine has been about earlier detection and treatment, all right? Mammography, self all of them. We're not doing anything here about this. Now this is not about an impact of our legislation about marijuana. This has always been true, but we do have an opportunity in this state because to transform a system that is so broken that only 10% of kids can get treatment who can benefit from it, to tr that takes an infusion of new resources. We could have an opportunity here to use some of the tax money uh, from marijuana revenue to actually get treatment in the schools until we find a system that could actually pay for that, right? Um, don't get me started. I've, <laughs> I've, you've already got me started, right? I proposed that to the mayor and the Denver <laughs> City Council. They approved it. Yeah, well, that's a good idea. Let's roll that out into some Denver public high schools based on your Adams City High School school-based treatment. That look pretty good results. And then they go, oh, we're not getting as much tax money as we thought. So we're good. they reneged on that promise. Mm. That is sad. It was not a surprise when those the high schools we went into were going to implement in. I uh, saw a report that record level of marijuana arrests in those kids at, at the high schools I won't tell you about, but crazy. But 90% can't access treatment. Um, so, and the other piece is that that's kind of a gap or a brokenness in our system is also for my entire career and for longer that the whole system grew up wrong. And we, we probably all know that. That is, um, um, in, when I was in child psychiatry training, there was no drug addiction treatment. I mean, I was seeing adolescents. Surely about 50% of them had some substance use going on. I had no training in how to deal with that, assess it, treat it, do anything, or when to refer. I mean, we, we carved that addiction was over here, mental health is over here. The problem is our, pa our patients walk through the door, adults and adolescents walk through the door, they've got both. If you have a substance use disorder, you, you know, um, you get a 60 to 80 percent chance of having a psychiatric, another psychiatric comorbidity. That, they go together. It's the rule, not the exception. For adults, for adolescents, if you walk in the mental health side of the, you know, the barn, uh, if you're an adolescent into adulthood, you have a much higher risk of having a substance use disorder because mental, health, mental illness, ADHD, depression, anxiety, name them they all bump your risk of developing a substance use disorder. They travel together and people who have substance and mental health problems have higher rates of medical illness, right? So it's like, so we, what, what do we do? We ask the patients who have the greatest burden of illness to guide, you know, you need to go to drug treatment over here and mental health treatment over here and your primary care, he, they're over there, to figure out how to integrate their own health care across a system that we cannot figure out how to integrate. And so, 
are we surprised that all the literature shows that, um, that, that people with comorbidity have poor treatment outcomes? Duh. We better figure it out, how, how to integrate treatment. At a minimum, we've got to integrate mental health and drug treatment, right? That has to happen. That has been something we've known since the mid-90s, the first National Institute on Drug Abuse treatment principles that I ever saw said we should integrate, that means concurrently treat mental illness and, and substance use disorders together. Because if you treat one, the other one doesn't go away and they complicate the clinical management and worsen the prognosis of both. Duh. So, but where is it? Do you see it anywhere? They're working on it yeah. because I'll tell you where, and I'll tell you another place you see it. I invented one because I've been doing this research for 20 years. It's like all of a sudden after doing all these clinical trials, I said, I think we have an integrate fully, in, like one-stop shopping, integrated mental health substance treatment program. We call it Encompass, but we, we had to develop a briefer version of that t that actually is feasible to implement in a school-based setting. So, and I'll say, just I'll conclude with that. But let's just not forget about adults. So moving on to that, we know that you know it's not a benign drug in in adults who can legally walk into the store and buy it or be on medical marijuana. That is, one out of eleven will become dependent. But the acute effects of acute marijuana intoxication are impaired memory. It's specifically toxic to the hippocampus. That's a really nice, important. I really love my hippocampus. It's memory. Right? I mean, you can convert what you read today into long-term memory. I remember it tomorrow. Right? Um, that's a really kind of a cool thing. Like, you don't have to, I have to read that again because I totally forgot what I read yesterday. I mean, college students who are at college smoking weed every day, parents who are paying that tuition, you're kind of, are you kidding me? They're, what are they learning? But <laughs> impaired short-term memory, working memory, like I told you the telephone number five times, can you not remember that telephone number? I mean, anxiety, reduced anxiety, yep, you see that. Disrupted motor control, um, longer reaction time, increased appetite, increased heart rate. Uh, it does clearly, although many kids and adults will say, the, the, last jo the hardest joint for me to give up is the one before bed. I just can't sleep with it. And I listen to that seriously because if I don't address their sleep problems, they're not going to be able to get clean. Uh, and so, you know, um, I'm not going to use a benzo for that, right? I'm going to use um, uh, probably trazodone is what I commonly use. But bo bottom line is, even though it appears that it helps you sleep, it interferes with REM sleep. And over time, that is a chronic sleep um, uh, deficit that you, you don't feel refreshed when you wake up. It reduces REM sleep. And we know that cannabis will um, w reduces pain. It's in that arachidonic acid pain pathway. I mean, there's a reason some, we have some quote-unquote medical indications for uh, uh, synthetic THC, Marinol, Nabilone, and uh, medical marijuana. I mean, it does reduce pain, and it can reduce anxiety, at least in the short term, for some. But for some, it can increase panic attacks and anxiety. And um, so... Cannabis receptors are everywhere in our brain. They're in the brain reward system, so addiction pathway for sure, but they're all over. It makes sense that you would have memory and cognition problems when you've got them scattered all through the prefrontal cortex. It makes sense you'd have coordination reaction times and poor motor skills because they're all over your cerebellum, right? It makes sense that it's addictive because it's in the brain re dopamine pathway, brain reward, makes sense because they're all over the hippocampus and where your, you know, your memory little system and movement disorders here, sensations here, they're not so much in your visual cortex. You don't often have visual hallucinations with cannabis, <laughs> right? That's one good thing. <laughs> uh, it impairs your judgment. They're all over here. Motivational systems, reward, appetite, immune function, reproduction. Oh, yeah, by the way, uh, it reduces... Uh, um, men who smoke are, are, have less fertility and all of that jazz, and women uh, less fertility uh, smoking marijuana. And it also, for adolescent girls, it interferes with the develop of the whole, whole fallopian system. It's not, not very good. That literature is out there as well. Heavy marijuana use over a long term, even in adults, uh, shrinks your brain. 
it really shrinks your hippocampus. You get a tiny little hippocampus, and which is why the memory is not so great. Um, so that's in adults, heavy smokers. Um, and amygdala, that's fear, recognition, all that kind of stuff. Long term, it, it also, even in adults whose brains are, you know, were constructed pretty much, it, it over time will destroy dendritic connections, axonal connections. It, it, it interferes with connectivity in the adult brain as well. Okie dokie. So what are we seeing? Well, we know that emergency department visits involving selected drugs, this is since 2008. So 2004 is blue, 2008 is red. And again, it's older data. That was before we even did medical marijuana. But this is Dawn national data. Um, uh, so eh, not so great, big for marijuana, but since 2009, and we have seen uh, uh, really a skyrocket in the number of emergency room presentations and hospitalizations uh, in kids inadvertently exposed to edibles. But the latest article that just came out in JAMA 2014, this just came out, and it was actually uh, from our ER. So our the biggest uh, Zane and Ken and Hurd uh, and Monty published that. They're seeing about a one, almost 1% 1 of ER visits, patients, are presenting with marijuana-associated illness. That may not be 1%. We never even saw that before. And what are those illnesses? Well, the acute intoxication, marijuana intoxication, like ear, wow, I just smoked one joint. Did you smoke the joint that we have in Colorado? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. I mean, I smoked a joint back in Nebraska. And this is, I smoked a joint here. <laughs> I'm in the ER, acutely intoxicated. <laughs> like, what is up with that? So acute intoxication, uh, or I just ate the other hot part of the cookie because I wasn't that high, because it takes an hour to get, and then you're sick. I mean, you're down for, I've heard, a day, two days. You can't even function. Um, so, you know, more of the edible story. But anxiety, panic attacks, psychosis, much more presentation psychosis. Um, this is not just children's hospital. This is our adult. This is our emergency room at the University of Colorado Anschutz Medical Center. Delirium, Co uh, cannabis-induced hyperemesis syndrome. At first, the ER docs were like, "What? What is this?" They would get a big GI workout. I mean, workup because why are you throwing up so much? And I was taking this bath, and then I was throwing up. Now we recognize it. It's cannabis-induced hyperemesis syndrome. And the weird thing about it is that you, you, it's intractable vomiting. Uh, which is dehydrating, right? And you, if you're older, I mean, you can get really sick from that, and you can't stop vomiting. The, the issue with that is you can't predict it because you can be, I just started smoking cannabis yesterday, and now I have it, or I've been smoking weed for 15 years, and it emerges. So anywhere in your cannabis-using career, this can come up, um, and it's difficult to treat. Hi hyperemesis syndrome, poisonings, and inadvertent exposure, these things are really um, much bigger issues and having a big impact on our patients um, or, or present our public health system. So uh, what do I want to say here? Nothing probably. Where do we go from here? Um, okay, so what is the kind of the bottom line here? I mean, obviously, we, we, the science has got to go to the public. I have some faith that science means data means something to people. And, and the public health, just, what is just, and no exaggeration. I mean, you remember the old ads, and you know, the fried egg, this is your brain on drugs. You, you can't do, you, you gotta be credible. You gotta stay right on this side of the line of science and not overstate it. And if it says something good, I mean, if it does something good, yeah, it's an anti-inflammatory. Uh, you gotta be right on the money to be stay credible. Otherwise you lose it and then you might as well be somebody, a dispensary owner, saying, I don't think it's addictive. I think it's not a problem. They, talk, they don't all talk like that. But <laughs> I like to think they do. Uh, oh, my God, how far is this television going? I am so in trouble. I know, right? I'm from Oklahoma. I can pull that out. I can pull it out. My relatives all talk like that. Okay, obviously, like public education, clinical medical, we have to, <laughs> clinical and medical subspecialty education. I mean, at first I was hearing stories from OB-GYN practices. Wow, we just kind of turned a blind eye for our patients who are on medical marijuana and they're pregnant. It's like, 
actually, do you know, I'm a psychiatrist. I should not be telling you about these studies, <laughs> right? But uh, we, that's not okay. That's really, it's, I hope you're convinced, that's really harmful. Uh, and uh, we should put the warning label on marijuana products. You know, problem, there was opposition to that in part because 40% of new users are women, most of whom are in childbearing age. Well, that will really reduce the market, won't it? Uh, especially, you know, first trimester. It's not like, you know, quit sometime during pregnancy. <laughs> it's right away. Uh, inadvertent exposures. I mean, I put duh. This is a duh. I mean, if we continue to allow marijuana edibles to be packaged in ways that are appealing to young children, we're, we're, we're just saying we're okay with this hospitalizations, not to mention the vets who are seeing animal poisonings. I mean, th that's crazy. So we have science-based public education prevention, but you know, with the prescription drug abuse and the marijuana going crazy in our high schools, we better get in there and do something. And we're, we're, we're really trying. It's hard to get funding. It's hard to make inroads into a system that like, we have to provide treatment, uh, mental health and drug treatment in settings that we're not used to providing it in. And we better get in our schools because where are the 90% of kids who could benefit from drug treatment, who can't receive it, who don't receive it? They are our high school students. Some middle school, but they are our high school students. And so, um, and we have to assist, we further than that, we need to know what, wrap our heads around what's the, um, what is the public health cost of this? We, we need to track it. And if we are really serious about tracking it, and, and so far I don't think we're serious yet because we would be tracking systematically the costs associated with the special educational services they're going to need to uh, treat these kids who are prenatally exposed and are adolescents inadvertent. What is the cost of these hospitalizations and ER visits and the impact on our system? And we've, we have recently heard more reports about a lot of um, homeless folks are moving here because, hey, legalized marijuana. Oh, I forgot my meds for my bipolar disorder. <laughs> We're seeing a big increase in our psych ERs that's really, and having to link them for the first time with s services is really bottlenecking the system. But that too, homelessness, <laughs> who, who's moving here to do that, uh, those costs are not being tracked a a accurately right now, I'm sure. And adolescents, I recently saw uh, this business about IQ in our kids. We're going to be the dumb state. I mean, I recently, I, saw, I heard an NPR report, I heard an NPR report that nationwide, uh, over the span of, while marijuana use has been increasing in adolescence, and I can't say that this is causal, this is just an observation, it's how I get ideas for science though, but they said that, that college entrance exams, you know, and the what SATs, ACT scores have been going down for a, a while. Around, it, it's overlapping kind of with the, with the increased marijuana use. Now, can I say, it, that's not causal, but it's interesting. Now, what we don't know is, well, if we looked at the medical marijuana states versus not, would it be the ACT, SAC scores of those states and those kids going, kind of more dragging down the national norms. To, to my knowledge, no one has looked at that. But we better get serious about looking at it, given this science that talks about persistent neurocognitive deficits when we have daily and near daily use at 30-year peak levels. Again, it's a duh. We better put treatment in the schools and screening. And when we did this at Adams City High School, we, we, we put in our, a brief version, eight sessions, right, of an integrated, one-stop shopping, mental health drug treatment called Encompass. We implemented it at Adams City High School. Every, and we said, just refer us the kids who already get in trouble for school-based drug and alcohol offenses, right? They're the kids you have to deal with anyway. You don't have to like go into the classrooms. Anybody using drugs? I mean, you don't have to do that. It's just give us the kids who already, there's about 150 a year at Adams City, just refer those kids. Every one of them, every single one referred to us met full criteria, full on for cannabis use disorder and some others. They have less psychopathology than I usually see in the community. It's like, and they were so much easier to treat. It's like, oh my God, we have to do this. NPR even picked up the story of the Adam City marijuana thing and still no funding, really. Um, so in adults, we need to, you know, the, the cannabis, the business industry advocates, well, it's kind of like Starbucks, right? I mean, you, the punch card, we want you to have a latte every day 
We don't want you to be an occasional recreational latte user and like have one a month. We want you to have a punch card and we'll give you a discount if you come in every day and wow, and I get a free latte. I mean, right, the, the, the profit motive is to get people to move to regular use, right? This benign, right, that is it. And so, so when you move to regular use, you have a cannabis use disorder. I mean, you have dependence. You become dependent if you use daily. So we're gonna have a lot more people becoming dependent. And then law, in law enforcement, we're not tracking the cost of law enforcement. The party line was decriminalization is gonna reduce those costs. But now we have a lawsuit against the state of Colorado from my state, Oklahoma and Nebraska. Because <laughs> it's going across state lines and it's messing with them. And um, we're gonna, we'll see about that. Anyway, so we do have this last thing, integrated treatment that we're nationally disseminating, but we developed a briefer version that we implemented at Adams City High School. And that briefer version, eight sessions, 50% of the kids who were referred to us, all of them met criteria. So we're reaching part of the 90% who could benefit but can't access treatment. They had at least one month of sustained abstinence by the end of treatment, and we only treated them for two months. So we don't see that in the community. 70% completed, and they were 90% compliant. That's because you're gonna get out of your home act and you're gonna to come to, it's pretty easy to do. Those, that's what we need to do. So I will stop there, questions, and I'll turn it over to Bob. Thank you. Thank you. So um, just quickly uh, who I am and I'll give you a, if you're not scared already, I'll give you tw 20 minutes of fright and then we can all sleep well tonight. So. Um, uh, I'm Bob Doyle, I'm the Executive Director of the Colorado Tobacco Education and Prevention Alliance and been working in tobacco prevention for 20 years and that's what drove me to the marijuana issue about three and a half years ago. Um, I was seeing what is in essence the same tobacco industry strategies and messaging that was used to normalize tobacco use as being used to normalize marijuana use. And so I got involved about three and a half years ago and um, the great thing about Colorado, um, not the mess we're in, but um, Dr. Riggs, we have some wonderful experts because I'm hoping I can't thank the health department enough for doing this because this is not happening in most places in the state where people are wanting getting educated about what is really happening around the science. So I applaud them and I applaud you for being here and I encourage you, do what I did three and a half years ago. I didn't know much about marijuana. And I said, okay, I'm going to look, what is the medical value? What is going on? What are the harms? And so hopefully you'll begin to see that today. Um, you begin to see some of the great research. We've got Dr. Thurstone, who's one of the, the, the country's best adolescent, you know, um, substance abuse mental health experts here in Colorado. There's a lot of great experts here that we can access. So Sunday I'm walking my dog and I live where I live, the middle school and high school right near my neighborhood. And so walking my dog and I see this on the ground, I say, what is that? And so it is Wellspring Medical Marijuana. Uh, Chocolope is the flavor, by the way. So right near my middle school and high school, which is, this is obviously one of the kids had, had dropped, it's empty, was empty. Um, so I'm not having marijuana in my possession. So, but this just tells you, this is the kind of world we live in. We live in a very different world. And so hopefully you'll get that perspective. I'll kind of give you what the tobacco, marijuana industry is up to and why we, how we recognize what's going on or need to recognize what's going on. I like to tell people I got my PhD in marijuana use from YouTube University. <laughs> so if you want to know how marijuana is baked, cooked, vaped, whatever you want to know, whatever, when you hear something you don't recognize, if you don't know what shatter is or wax or hash oil, go to YouTube and you'll find out all about it. And that's the scary part. I'm a parent of young children. I'm trying to stay a step ahead, but kids have access to this. There is an online world of marijuana use that you all need to be aware of that is glamorizing it. It's a instructional how-to from A to Z, from whatever marijuana you want to try or whatever you want to do with marijuana. We went through this, uh, that piece. So first question is this, the first one and only trivia question, is this a pharmacy? No. Good, everyone passed. In Colorado, we dispense our medical marijuana and market it like alcohol. So one of the things that we try to I educate people about is when I talk here in other states is, I hope when I'm done you understand the difference between cannabis-based medicine and the medical marijuana movement and industry, which has very little to do with science and patient-focused activities and more about commercialization of marijuana use. And you'll see, I think I'll hit that home pretty quickly. 
So this is the timeline for our marijuana system. Basically what happened in 2009 and 10, the federal government said, we're going to look the other way. And that's when we had this mass explosion of commercialization in medical. So when people ask, well, how's that commercialization going? I said, well, it's been going on for about five years. And as Dr. Riggs talked about, we have a lot of good data. So this is our medical marijuana law. You are 18 years of age. Um, I can have six plants, two ounces of possession versus one ounce for the legal, the vote for um, legalization, it's 21 and it's one ounce, but for medical, it's two ounces and 18. So in essence, what I've done, what we've done is, yep. go ahead. For those of us that are completely uneducated, yeah. how many joints can you get from it? Good, um, yep, so that was going to be my next statement. <laughs> so the danger of what we've done, for those of you who work in schools, are those, so legally, if I'm 18, I get about 50 joints per ounce. So legally in the state of Colorado, I could have 100 joints in my pocket on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, you can do nothing about it. So we have turned that 18, 19 year old into the distributor for the school, yes. right? So that's a big problem. Another thing we learned, and I learned after the vote, what a plant can produce. This may not sound like a lot to the general public. Well, just six plants. I can get one to five pounds of marijuana per plant. So when Adam, we just had a bust in Adams County where a caregiver had rented two homes and had 30 plant grow operations in the basement of both homes. Now again, to the public, they may not sound like, you know, I'm thinking 30 plants, they're about yay big. Not a big deal. But when I think that might be anywhere from 30 to 150 pounds of marijuana, that's a lot of care going on, <laughs> right? So that's really important that we understand we have a system that really is set up to feed a black market. It's also um, obviously can produce a lot of marijuana. So to be a caregiver, you basically need to be 18 and not a whole lot else. <laughs> so understand as medical professionals, public health people, there is an online world of medical marijuana. So the Denver Post partnered with Leafly.com and the Denver Post has a marijuana website called The Cannabis, which glamorizes and promotes marijuana use. And they had on their website various strains of marijuana. 88 strains they said would treat depression, 25 would treat PTSD, 40 would treat ADHD, ADD, 23 would treat bipolar. So myself, Dr. Thurstone, and Dr. Eden Evans from Massachusetts General Substance Abuse Program wrote to the Denver Post in Leafly and said, please, for each of these recommendations, give us the dosage, give us the duration, counterindications. Are you recommending that they stop taking their approved medications for bipolar, for depression? So the bottom line is what the Denver Post editor responded was, it's mostly like crowdsourcing. That's how we say, so if somebody says it's working well for their depression, that's what we're going to write. Is that medicine? Is that patient-focused medicine? And what you hear about, which is very frightening, is when you hear about the mental health implications of marijuana use and how there's an online targeting of mental, people with mental health issues, um, that's very distressing. The Post stopped doing this, thank goodness. So we're able to get them to stop it. Leafly has not stopped. This is Girl Scout cookie marijuana, <laughs> which can be used to treat bipolar, PTSD. So Leafly, which is a national group, has not stopped doing it. So it's important as you understand when you talk, to, you're working with youth, you're working with young adults, they are being told it is going to treat their, their mental health issues. So that's really important. This is a medical dispensary with free joint Friday. Okay. Now, how many of you have been to a pharmacy in the last month and you had free Vicodin Tuesday? <laughs> Anybody? <laughs> Didn't happen? Oxy, what was that? I'm still looking for Okay. Oxycontin Tuesday maybe? Maybe happy hours, right? And as I tell my friends in the media who won't cover this story, I say, please, go to the dispensary. I said, if, if a pharmacy dispensed medicine in this way, you would be at their doorstep with your cameras in five minutes, the FDA would be there in 10 minutes, right? This is not patient-focused medicine. So when people tell you they're taking medical marijuana, I had a, a pediatrician that we work with down in the Springs, he had a, a, some, a young person that he's worked with for some time who's taking medical marijuana and he asked her, he said, you know, you, we've been working together for a long time. 
When you got that prescription, did you get a full exam? No. Did they give you a dosage, a duration? Did they want you to come back and see how it's going? No. That's the difference. So people, we don't, I don't like to even use the word medical with medical marijuana because it's not a medical system. Again, this is an ad for medicine, the dancing joint for 99 cents. We also have cotton candy medical cannabis, right? So again, everything we've had, everything has been infused with, any child product you can imagine has been infused with marijuana in Colorado and is, was under the guise of medicine first, but now is recreational. This is cannabis-based medicine. This is something called Sativex. Has anybody heard of Sativex? So here's what's interesting. I've been doing this presentation in I don't know how many states and across the state for three years. In clinical settings, rotaries, whatever, you name it. Nobody knows about Sativex. This is not an endorsement of Sativex. But we are supposedly the epicenter of medical marijuana, but we don't know about Sativex. It's, in, it's going through FDA um, approval for MS spasticity, cancer pain. It's going through clinical trials to see is it going to work? Is it going to do what we say it's going to do? That's cannabis-based medicine, right? That's what we want. You all heard about the young kids with uh, Dravet syndrome, they have epilepsy. They're getting um, what's, they're now in a trial getting, the same company that makes um, Sativex makes something called Epidiolex, it's a CBD pill. Um, and so they're getting, there's gonna be constituents in marijuana that could have medical value and that's great. But this is a clinical trial where the kids are being monitored, they're being watched, and it's, this is a very um, um, exact process to extract cannabidiol from the marijuana plant. So there are approved, as was mentioned before, there are some FDA approved um, medicine based. So this is the difference between red card marijuana, as I call it, or FDA approved. There's no clinical trials, there's no proven safety, no efficacy. What happens if we have a, a bad me medicine from a dispensary? There's no recall, there's no process. So again, um, not good medicine. Why is smoked not good medicine? Um, this is, um, California classifies marijuana smoke as a carcinogen. There's at least 33 chemicals in tobacco and mar marijuana smoke classified as carcinogens. So this is why medicine, in smoke form is not good because one, when I combust something, I get all these bad chemicals. And then I'm also, um, on top of it, I can't regulate a dose when I'm smoking, right? So that's important. This just came out today. Evidence linking merits from the American Heart Association, evidence linking marijuana and risk of stroke. Science will catch up. Is the science where it is with tobacco? No, but science catches up. And don't let, the, don't let that vague, you know, the absence of science, if you will, be an opening for people, well, it doesn't cause this or that, and we don't have the evidence to say no, we can't say causation yet. But as a tobacco person who knows that you are ingesting this into your lungs and all those bad chemicals are getting in your blood and going throughout your system, that's a concern because we've learned more about how tobacco smoke causes a variety of cancers and heart disease. So this also came out last week discussing the potency suggested the risk of psychosis is five times higher for regular users of cannabis. And this was the, what they're seeing in Britain is the same thing we're seeing here, is the use of what they call skunk. It's a high potency marijuana, which is what we have here. Here's the 12 to 17 year olds, red or medical marijuana states, blue or not. If you see a trend, probably. <laughs> so let's get into the last part of this real quick. This is from Vice Magazine, the co-founder of Vice Magazine, who wrote this, he decided to smoke some of the marijuana that's available. He said, a funny thing happened on the way to the courthouse. As the talk of decriminalization became more mainstream, the drug itself became more hardcore. I'm so high, in fact, I no longer see legalization of marijuana such a no-brainer. The debate has shifted, should we really legalize a, uh, legalize a really heavy, heavy drug? That's what this is. This is not Woodstock weed. This is not somebody smoking a joint that has three or five percent THC. So if you were, somebody was smoking marijuana in the 90s, 70s, 60s, 80s, average THC was 3 to 5 percent. That's the psychoactive ingredient. We now make the most potent marijuana in the world. If you talk to law enforcement, they will tell you, and I do, we have a 19-year-old that we're working with who just got through drug treatment, he'll tell you the same thing. Cartel marijuana is minor leagues. We, are the big, we have the best, most potent marijuana in the world. So here. These are medical marijuana, of course. Death Star, which is always a good medicine name. Um, <laughs> all of us with doctor says, here, you need to take Death Star for your pain. 24% um, THC. So again, 
six, seven, eight times more potent than what we had before. Peyton Manning strain, he did not endorse it. 22%, um, they no longer have Peyton Manning strain, they've taken that off. Banana Kush, 18%. And this is the world of marijuana. We have never made marijuana, for our high school, I saw some high school counselors here, we have never made marijuana use easier to conceal, easier to use in the entire history of public health. I can ingest all of these and you won't know it. And by the way, I bought these items right here. In front of me was the recreational case and back of me was the medical case and they were the same thing. And no, there were no doctors or pharmacists behind the medical case, so it's all the same product. But again, this is Fruity Pebbles, and literally probably Fruity Pebbles. We took this up to a press conference in Oregon, and this, go buy these at the, the convenience store today. They're the exact same thing. They look exactly the same. So this is a danger for employers, for schools, for everyone, because I can ingest all these, and the danger, of course, with edibles is the high comes on later. A young girl in Wisconsin ate her blue kudu bar that dad brought home from Colorado. She was found at school with barely a pulse. So what happens is I ingest it, I don't feel high, and I ingest more, and I ingest more. You know the young man who jumped off the balcony in Denver, a cannabis due psychosis, he ate a marijuana cookie with six joints worth in, you know, and he was supposed to eat it in six pieces. That's how we all eat cookies, right? <laughs> when you go home today, you're gonna have your chocolate cake and you're gonna cut that cake up into 10 pieces and eat them one every half hour. So we make we have registered by category of 18 types of gummy bears, seven types of cereals, 18 types of cookies, six types of soda, you get the picture. When people say this is the Joe Camp, people like, we had Joe Camel, of course, talking about a cartoon character targeting children. The marijuana industry is targeting children on steroids. Because I, I have a seven and eight year old. And I don't have to do any convincing to say a gummy bear, cupcake, soda, lollipop are gonna be appealing to that child. So I, we warn people, you know, one of the things we say is, if you, and I, I was at a presentation for parents a few nights ago, do not, if your child, do not have your child accept product, food products from anyone they do not know, period. That's the safest thing to do, because you just don't know. Let me finish with, this is the really scary world of vaporizing. These are all nicotine vaporizing products. Um, E-juice, my public service announcement, if you know anybody who's using these E-juice, they better lock it up. Liquid nicotine is insanely poisonous. We had our first death of a two-year-old in New York. Um, poison control calls for marijuana and for nicotine are going up, and this is the main reason. So, and these all come in children appealing flavors, bubble gum, strawberry, you name it. It's all coming for kids. So this is a new world. Kids are not just getting a new world of marijuana through edibles. They're getting a whole new world of what smoking is like. So this is really important. This is the marijuana vaping world. Snoop Dogg has his own line. We've got beautiful products that appeal to boys and girls, men and women. And what's important, High Times Magazine says, um, offers consumers a stealthy way to get high in almost any location. Rolling Stone calls them the iPod of getting baked, almost a scentless vapor that can be hit on a bathroom or on a street. The marijuana vaping world is making it so you can conceal your public use. And remember, there is no law in the United States that allows public use. So that should tell you a little bit about the marijuana industry. But this is a very scary world for, for anybody, because what can happen here, Poison Control came to present to us, I don't know, maybe a year ago, talked about, and we saw, we've seen news reports about kids you can crush up Oxycontin and put a vaporizer. And DEA uh, scientists told me that most drugs are water-soluble, almost any drug can go in these. Alcohol goes in these. So this is a whole new world of drug use. These are Digitoke for women. We have Yokan, this is a, um, marijuana vaporizer, but again, you won't know. I'll be standing, you won't know if somebody's you know, using these. Are they using nicotine? Are they using marijuana? Are they using hash oil? This is mass producing of hash oil. This is called the crack of, you know, we look at shatter, wax, hash oil, sometimes called the crack of marijuana, 60, 80% THC, 15, 20 times stronger than the marijuana somebody was using of yesteryear, insanely potent. We've talked to, we have Jefferson County High School kids will tell us they go in the bathroom and get a hit off their marijuana vaporizer and go back to class. Now when we were young, now I'm 22, so, um, 50, oh, fi uh, 51, 
So, but, so I grew up when marijuana use was probably at one of the highest levels. So marijuana use was everywhere. We had a smoking section in our school. And when you remember the bathrooms, you'd open the door to the bathroom and that plume of smoke would come <laughs> wafting out. So you knew people were using, and kids who were smoking marijuana smelled like pot. Nowadays, I can be using vaporing devices, cookies, you're not going to know it because you're not going to smell it. I brought this with me. So this is um, a vaporizer you can buy here that could be used with e-juice or it can be used with wax. A dab of wax, just a pinhead of wax, is about one to two joints worth of marijuana. This young man I'm working with, 19 years old, just got a drug treatment. He was dabbing about 10 to 12 times a day, which means plus smoking marijuana, plus taking prescription meds. So he was smoking about 20 joints plus a day. And this is confiscated vaporizers from, school, from high school students here. Notice it's a tank system so that it can take these liquids. So again, not the majority of people who are you don't assume if somebody has a vaporizer, they're using hash oil or cocaine or something, okay? So most people are not using it for that means, but it's a really important if you're going in, you're seeing impairment in somebody and they're using a vaporizer, you should begin to see that, well, maybe it isn't just nicotine in there. This is the new vaporizer that vaporizes both dry plant, this marijuana and tobacco plant. So here's some of the data. We talked about the ER visits. So look at the use rates. Anybody see a trend? <laughs> Colorado exceeds the national average in every single age category. It does not matter what it is. Look at you know, every single one. Look at our 18 to 25 rate is almost 30%. And talk about the developing brain. Talk about the problems we're going to get with this. So our heavy marijuana users, 23% of our people who say they're using once the last 30 days are using every day. One out of every five are using at least 26 days or more. So again, that's very concerning. We are 50% higher than the national average. Um, again, Rocky Mountain Poison Center, we talked. Look at Denver's use rates. Denver's eighth grade marijuana use rate is more than three times the national average. So as we say, Denver looking the other way, deciding, well, we won't do drug treatment, but we will green light 300 marijuana stores in our community. So that's a problem. ER visits, we talked about. It is impairing DUID. These are the DUID marijuana positives um, in Colorado. And so I think that's it. So I tried to get through it really quickly, but so the message I think importantly for everybody is, I'll, you can, we can uh, pass these around or if you want to look at these devices. So, yep. Today I have some on sale for cheap, but I won't do that. Oh, no. No, I'm not. Uh, it depends. It depends on what. It depends on how, where you're buying it. Medical can be cheaper, but I brought my. Actually, I'll. I'll answer that question in a second because I brought the Westward with me, which has all sorts of prices in it. You can see. Any other questions from folks?